probably get going at that. So thank you very much everyone for coming today. Um, I'm Sam Thompson, the Outreach and Engagement Officer and Emotional Support Worker and a Group Work Facilitator with a charity called Survivors UK. So I am obsessed with the charity. I am very busy with this charity, but there are much worse things to be um, taking up my time. Um, first and foremost, thank you all for coming today and all who are watching this recording. So throughout, I'm probably going to be swapping tenses to say thank you. So bear with me on that one. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for dedicating an hour, maybe a little bit over an hour, um, five or so minutes over to just dedicate some time to speaking about this very important um, cause, which is supporting male, non-binary and transgender survivors. So today it goes without saying, we are gonna be speaking about something that is quite intense. This is quite an upsetting topic. it will be quite a moving topic. It can also be quite an inspiring topic to engage with, but sometimes we wake up and it's a cold dreary Thursday during 2020, the worst year of our lives. And sometimes we're just not ready to engage with this topic or any upsetting topics. And that's completely okay. We are all human. So if for any reason you want to leave this talk, you want to pause it, you want to leave the room, that is a-okay. Or if you just want to mute me for 30 seconds, completely fine. You need to make sure you're being safe when you're engaging in this topic, just as much as I need to as well. So with that, on this slide, whether you're watching now or recording, my email is on the bottom right hand corner, sam.thompson at survivorsuk.org please, please do get in touch with me if anything is brought up for you, whether that is personally, you spot a typo, you want to just chat to me, that is A-OK. -okay. I will always try and be as helpful and as kind as possible. Now, as I have mentioned probably about five times now, we are recording today. So anyone who is here right now, please do bear that in mind. So I'm going to politely ask if we can keep our mics on mute and that if there are any questions that we ask them at the end, potentially when the recording has stopped, but I will let you know when that is because um, the lovely Joe will give me um, a sign to say that that's happened. Now it goes without saying as well, thank you so much to Goldsmith Student Union for letting me be here, especially with Joe, you've done so much to help us as a charity out and to let us come here today. Um, and that is due to the brilliant team that you are part of, which is so important to Goldsmiths. Um, so thank you so much. Now today, what I'm going to be doing is primarily speaking, or I will only be speaking about the experiences of sexual violence in relation to men, non-binary and transgender people. Now, by no means am I here today to diminish the experience of anyone who does not identify as male, non-binary or transgender. And just on the topic of language, unfortunately, a lot of research and a lot of the law still treats gender as a binary construct, i.e. only male and only female. Now, myself and Survivors UK, we understand that gender is a massive spectrum and it is a ever developing field and we love that. But unfortunately, a lot of the law, a lot of research is lagging behind. So when I am speaking about some research, please do forgive me if it seems as though it is very binary. Where possible, I will be um, explaining how gender is more than just a binary construct. And finally, on this safety sort of long spiel, I will be primarily using the word survivor to describe someone who may have experienced sexual violence or victim survivor. I do understand that not everyone is comfortable with that term, but just to be as inclusive as possible, I will be using that term. So let's get going without further ado before I uh, bore you with just one slide. So it would be a bit rude if I came to a university talk and I didn't present some statistics for you all. Each year in England and Wales alone, 85,000 women report that they are victims or survivors of rape. One in five women or up to one in three women report that they have experienced some form of sexual violence. And 25% of women report that they are victims or survivors of forced sex whilst at university. Now, for those of you that were just listening to what I mentioned on that first slide, I mentioned how I'm primarily going to be speaking about men and non-binary survivors, but I've just presented a slide of statistics related to female survivors. That is because I wanted to highlight something incredibly important that we are shown in the media in terms of support for survivors. If after this talk or during, if you're watching it now, you wanted to Google, sexual violence support campaign. These would be the first 15 that you would find on Google Images. 
and how many of these could show support for a male non-binary or transgender survivor? You would be given three, three out of 15 for those actively looking for support. So now I'd like to revisit some of these statistics and these I would like to stress are much harder to find, much more hidden in the research. So yes, 85,000 women in England and Wales alone are victims or survivors of rape. And so are 12,000 men. And I could probably spend this entire hour speaking about the difference between actual statistics and just reported statistics, but I won't bore you with that. One in five women or up to one in three women have experienced some form of sexual violence. So have one in six men. And 25% of women report that they are victims or survivors of forced sex at university. And so to 15% of men. So I'm now going to give you guys just some time to relate to this topic in a way. Um, something that we might not realise that we just haven't really addressed, or I especially didn't address before working with Survivors UK. So who here, um, or whoever is watching, just quietly think to yourself, have you seen any of these three shows? So Family Guy, Law and Order SVU, and South Park. I'll give you two seconds. So since airing, Family Guy, Law and Order, and South Park have included 15, eight, and seven male rape and sexual abuse jokes within their episodes. Now, for those of you that have seen these, uh, Family Guy and South Park, they are known to walk the line of what can be joked about and what really should not be joked about. For anyone that has watched them, we know that they, they've gotten into trouble before and we know that we really shouldn't repeat some of these jokes outside of the episodes. And for Law and Order, they already handle topics of male rape and sexual abuse, so maybe the writers thought it made sense to include male rape jokes. I don't know, you be the judge. So what about these shows? So Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Friends, Glee, Saturday Night Live. I'll give you again two seconds. Seven, four, three, and 19 male rape and sexual abuse jokes. Now what's slightly more worrying about these shows is they are audiences, they are marketed, sorry, towards audiences that are slightly younger. So teenagers, maybe young adults, especially with things like Glee. These might be people that aren't as aware of what can be joked about and what really should not be joked about. These are people that might not have had education around this topic, but maybe, okay, we're trying to make excuses. We know that Saturday Night Live is satirical and Glee and Buffy the Vampire Slayer, maybe these young adults, these older children might have had really helpful talks around sexual violence for people of all genders. But maybe, just maybe they have, we don't know. But then what do we say for these shows, guys? Looney Tunes, The Simpsons, The Powerpuff Girls and SpongeBob SquarePants. One, four, two, one, male rape and sexual abuse jokes in cartoons. Cartoons audience, marketed, sorry, towards preschool children, often children who have not yet even started education. In The Powerpuff Girls, just for context, for anyone that has watched it, Mojo Jojo, the main antagonist, for those of you that haven't watched it, goes to prison and it is alluded to that he is raped in prison. A child watching this is given this suggestion that male rape is okay if it's towards a villain, if it's towards a cartoon character. In SpongeBob SquarePants, dropping the soap is joked about. And it doesn't stop there. There are hundreds upon hundreds of male rape and sexual abuse jokes in our media. Somewhere along the line, some writer somewhere said, do you know what would be really funny? A man or a boy being sexually abused or raped, because that would add some sort of humour to our storylines. And as we've just seen, and as is in this list, these aren't just unknown shows. These are award-winning shows. These are incredibly popular shows with massive amounts of reach. 
hundreds upon hundreds of male rape and sexual abuse jokes compared to just three support campaigns for those actively looking for it. Now, whether we like it or not, the media is such an important part of our lives. Like even if we don't watch TV at all, it will impact our lives. And that will have an impact on the experience of reporting abuse as will so many things in our lives. But it will impact the experience of reporting abuse, as I just said. And it is estimated that 96% of male survivors actually never go on to report their experience of sexual violence. And this is going to be another sort of like interactive guessing game, just maybe quietly uh, for a few seconds to yourself. The average time that it takes for a man to speak about their experience of sexual violence is X amount of weeks. I'm going to give you five seconds just quietly to yourself. Guess how many weeks do you think it takes on average? Five, four, three, two, one. So the actual answer is 1,352 weeks, which is 26 years, which is probably older than most of us who are here today. For context, I'm 24. That means that someone has kept this silent, this life-changing and potentially traumatic event silent without speaking about it. Um, I'm also just aware that the chat is going um, and I, I just want to say I'm not able to actually see that right now um, but if, it, if there are any questions I'm really sorry I might have to answer them at the end. Um, very sorry about that. But 26 years, that is the amount of time that it takes on average and of course there will be people who are significantly longer, i.e. people that take it to the grave and there will also be people who are significantly shorter. And I would love to spend a lot of time speaking about mental health, but just in the interest of time, I, um, I won't be able to, I won't be able to do it much justice. But it is very important to remember how intertwined mental health difficulties are with sexual violence. So knowing things uh, due to brilliant organisations like Calm and the Samaritans, that suicide is the biggest killer of men under the age of 45, and that men are three times more likely to take their life than women. Knowing these is really important because it can create these warning signs around sexual violence to know that someone might be struggling. And although there isn't a lot, there are up and coming brilliant pieces of research that are raising more awareness for things around men having uh, one in eight men in England having a common mental health problem and men worldwide being 32% less likely to seek out primary care for mental health difficulties, being less likely to speak about what they are struggling with. And unfortunately, that's about it when we come to research and statistics for male rape and sexual abuse, including, well, for male rape and sexual abuse and even less research for non-binary and transgender people. Before starting with Survivors UK, I was under the illusion that a lot more was being done, that, you know, this is such an important topic. So much is obviously going to be done and more legislation is being made and it, things like that. But there is a significant lack of awareness for this topic. And this lack of awareness leads to a lack of research and the lack of research leads to a lack of awareness. And that leads to male rape and sexual abuse jokes. That leads to people thinking that it's OK to make these jokes and myths are made in society. And then it goes around to that lack of awareness again. And this cycle is made where people just aren't speaking about it. And it isn't something that people even have on their radar, which is very pessimistic um, to say. And it's quite a negative thing to say. But what's wonderful is this cycle is being broken today. Whether you are watching this five months from now, whether you're watching this with or you're here right now listening to me you are breaking a cycle that people just aren't aware of. You are one of the very few people speaking about this, which is, I cannot stress, so fantastic. So thank you so much. Now, I always sigh when this bit comes up because myths are such a common thing to speak about when it comes to sexual violence. And usually when I deliver these talks, I think this is the bit that people are like, oh, here we go. But the really unfortunate thing is we are still at a place in society where there are very common myths that people accept that people don't talk about because sexual violence isn't a very popular thing to speak about. 
we don't go to parties and say guys let's not play never have i ever let's talk about myths around sexual violence because it's not something we want to engage with it's it's heavy it can be hard to talk about but you've come here today so we're going to be speaking about them and again if you want to i'm going to give you a few seconds just to think in the top left hand box i'm going to have a statement and it could be a myth it could be a reality you're going to be the judge and then in the green box i'm going to go through maybe why that is a fact or why it's actually a myth so let's start with men can't be sexually assaulted myth or fact i'll give you again just two seconds so this is a myth um and i would like to stress don't feel bad if you get these wrong or if you get them right i mean this is a space to learn and it's maybe a space to confirm what you already know or challenge what you might already know um so this is a myth any man or boy can be sexually assaulted regardless of their size strength or appearance now usually not all the time but usually when i uh when i do this talk and i hear i usually hear people go myth of course i hear a chorus of people saying myth which is lovely to hear. But what will happen is I'm usually the last person in a room because I just want to make sure that everyone's able to speak to me afterwards. People might come up and trickle up afterwards and say, do you know what? I knew, I knew that men could be sexually assaulted or men and boys could be sexually assaulted, but I didn't know it could be a strong man. I didn't know that it could be someone who's masculine, who was tall, who was in an authority position. And this idea of strength suddenly becomes this confounding variable for being able to be subjected to sexual violence, because this idea that you can fight off a perpetrator for some reason or other has anything to do with that experience of sexual violence, when in reality, anyone of any size, of any strength, any appearance, any demographic information can be affected by sexual violence, and they are. We just don't speak about it. Gay men are more likely to be raped or sexually abused or sexually assaulted, harassed or any form of sexual violence. So again, this is a myth. Now, I would like to stress that with statistics, um, and the reason why I sometimes have a bit of a bugbear with statistics is, I mean, hopefully you, you might all know this being at university, that if you, are, if you go looking for a statistic, you will probably find something that supports your theory unless you say something completely outlandish. But with this uh, myth, a lot of people come back and they say they, they have a really hard time with this one because of the horror stories that we hear around clubbing and, and the, the men who have sex with men scene or the LGBTQIA plus scene. But the reason why this is a myth and why it's so important to remember that this is a myth when we see these statistics come out is Heterosexual gay and bisexual men are equally likely to be um, victims or survivors of sexual violence. Because the moment we begin to, well, let me start with, we have hopefully all heard things like, it wasn't what you were wearing, and it wasn't how much you drank, it wasn't what drug you'd taken, it wasn't what club you were at, it wasn't that you were walking home, it wasn't that you had headphones in. Because the moment we do that is when we begin to victim blame because we are blaming this person for living their life. And for some reason or other, that has implied that they deserved sexual violence in some way, shape or other. And obviously that isn't true because the only person to blame for an instance of sexual violence is the perpetrator. So the same, is, same goes for your sexuality, for your gender, for where you were, for the drink you, been drinking, for the drug you might have taken, for the club that you were at. It has nothing to do with the victim or survivor. The only person to blame is the perpetrator. Survivors of sexual violence or victims or survivors of sexual violence will become abusers themselves, myth or fact. So this is again a myth. Now, the vast majority of children who are sexually abused do not go on to abuse others. In fact, it's around 75% do not go on to abuse others. But some of you who are here today, you might be parents, you might be siblings, you might be around young children, you might be scout leaders, I don't know. Now, let's imagine that 
that this survivor that we're talking about is here in this room today and they've just heard this myth and they thought it was true and the next thing they're around their sibling and they want to give their younger sibling a hug or they want to play with their child or they want with their sibling they want to help bathe their sibling or whatnot while in the back of their head they are thinking because I was sexually abused I am either already or going to go on to sexually abuse my sibling or this other young person around me when in reality they probably won't but how harmful that must be to their mental health thinking that this is going to happen like without any input from myself no free will, self-fulfilling prophecy, I am going to become a sexual abuser. How harmful that must be, A, to themselves, and B, to forming this healthy relationship with that younger person. An erection and or ejaculation or orgasm in general means that you have enjoyed that experience, myth or fact. Myth, again, now there is a significant myth around um, men, bo uh, men, boys, uh, or anyone really, that they are in a constant position of being ready and wanting sex, which is not true. And a physiological response may actually result from mere physical contact or extreme stress, but this does not imply that you wanted or consented to that experience. Now, shaming someone um, so a perpetrator of sexual violence shaming uh, someone around experiencing an erection, orgasm or ejaculation is a very powerful tool to creating this self-doubt, to creating this blame, self-blame. And it can lead them to not speaking about their experience of sexual violence, which we're actually going to come on to a little bit later. But it is a very significant thing currently in society that we have this idea that men for some reason or other are constantly wanting to have sex when it's not true. And before we answer this one, are men far less affected by rape? I'd like us to maybe think of the ways in which the narratives around sexual violence can affect female survivors. And just as a safety warning, this next slide can be quite upsetting. So if you do want to mute me for just 30 seconds, 60 seconds, please do feel free. So first we have the emotional. We have guilt, shame, self-blame, embarrassment, sadness, vulnerability, isolation, fear, and so many more that can be experienced of anyone of any age. We have the psychological. We have nightmares, flashbacks, diagnoses of depression, PTSD, phobias, so many more. And of course, we have the physical sleep disorders, increased startle responses, physical injury, suicidal ideation, self-harm ideation, or acting on these ideations. Now of these that are on the board that we generally hear around the narratives of female survivors, can anyone guess what I might say a male or non-binary survivor might experience? it's the exact same. Now, of course, there are slight nuances, of course, between when we think of sex and um, for a cisgender female who might, who, who has been um, a victim or survivor of sexual violence, they may experience something like pregnancy, which of course can be incredibly traumatic for this survivor. But that experience shouldn't diminish any of these words that are currently on the board. But yet we hear this all the time. We are shown this all the time, that men are far less affected by rape and sexual violence. When in reality, they are just as likely to experience the emotional, psychological and physiological traumas post abuse. They're just significantly less likely to speak about it. So I'm actually gonna give you a short rest from my voice. Oh, I don't know what's happened there. Um, with the formatting, but I would like to play you a video um, and I'm hoping that the formatting hasn't um, completely messed it up um, and I should have shared my audio, but if um, the audio hasn't shared, um, Joe, I'm actually going to call on you here. If the audio doesn't um, come through properly, please call out and let me know. Um, but other than that, it's around...
six minutes. Um, so just sit back, watch, relax. Um, and I won't give you too much preamble because I think it speaks for itself. Okay. I was sexually abused when I was about eight by an older male cousin. I've been sexually assaulted on four different occasions. I was six years old, the first time that I was molested. A neighbor named Hank took me into his house. And at first it was hugging, and then his hands traveled. And when I tried to push him away, he beat me. And then he raped me. And I was haunted by the fact that this happened in a little girl's bedroom. For a long time, I blamed myself. I was just angry because I'd go to school and nobody in school knew what was going on. When I tried to tell my mom, she kicked me out of the house and laughed at me and told me I would never deserve anything better. It became something that lasted until I was 17 years old. I remember after it happened and after he left, sitting on a bed for a while, torn up and saying, I am never going to tell another living person about this. I went and got my friends and I drove them home. Thank you for reading that, Katrina. Thanks. Now, if you had the chance, how would you respond to this person's story? I just feel like, or just like, her <laughs> um, and just let you know let her know it's not her fault you were a little girl and it's not your fault honey you actually have the chance to meet that person because they're here today this is James Metters. This is Mark Godoy Jr. This is Isaac Andrade. This is Walter Castaneda. This is Glenn Hall. He served in the army for 30 years retiring as command sergeant major and what you just read is his story what you just read was his story. Oh my god. How are you doing? Good, how are you? Doing good. <laughs> Thank you for reading my story. I know the statistic is one in six. I'll go into a room and I'll count six men. I'm like, there's somebody else in here. And they're probably dealing with it the same way I've dealt with it, which is not talking about it. To share the same experience, um, I was young and I was in college. I was sexually abused. You know, we don't talk about these things, but it happens, you know. I grew up in a Latino household where my, I know what that's like. <laughs> my dad telling me, no llores, cabrón. No eres vieja, you're not a, a girl, don't cry. And on the other side, you're getting abused and you don't know what to say. I joined the army to die. I was abused from the time I was born till I was 17. Masculinity made me put away what I was feeling and not really deeply feel what had happened to me and recognize and acknowledge what happened to me. Getting suspended in the fourth grade, getting in a fight, getting expelled from one high school, it's all part of the abuse and it's all part of me and my child, my inner child acting out and starving for attention. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons I rose in the rank of the military, they like tough guys, but inside I was dying. This still makes me emotional. <sighs> that what happened to me wasn't because of who I am. It was something that was done to me. Um, it's not me. I know a lot of males are too afraid to speak up, but I'm real open because I want to inspire the male yeah. survivors. That not just males with disabilities, but also males without disabilities. Yeah. I identify myself as a black gay survivor. I had a lot of fear and I just Post a link on Facebook saying, this is my story. If you want to read it, you can read it. And the response I got after that was uh, nothing but kind. Every time I share my story, um, especially as a man, I, I always hear back, hey, can I talk to you? Yeah, what's up? This happened to me too. This happened to me too. 
it's happened to me too. I'm not doing it just for myself. It's mm -hmm. for many others who voices not been heard before. It's really hard not to cry. <laughs> um, I'm really glad you've done the work, and I know that you changed somebody's life. So that's all I can say without crying. <laughs> you can survive it. You can get through it. I think you're just so strong. <laughs> like I don't know if you know it, but you're you're very strong. Thank you. I'm going to stop the video there just because obviously the formatting um, was a bit weird, unfortunately. Sorry. Um, but thank you for watching that video. Um, now, I, I love that video for hundreds and hundreds of reasons. Um, I think everyone who spoke in that um, had an incredibly powerful thing to say. But one of my favorite things that one of the um, one of the survivors said in that video um, was from Mark Goodoy Jr., the, the guy with the hat. And he says, sexual violence or sexual abuse is something that happened to me. It is not who I am. And I think that is such a powerful um, and moving thing to hear because especially in the context of what we're talking about today, we are, I've mentioned before, and I'm sure you know, we are human and humans have in, um, since we're like when we're born, we have brilliant things that help us to survive. Um, for any of you who are watching this, who might study psychology or any other things um, that are relating to human behavior, we stereotype because it is what we do and it's helpful to survive. Now, stereotyping is helpful sometimes in order to survive, but more often than not, um, I find it's really not helpful. And when we say, the word survivor or think of a survivor, we unpack this stereotype and this box um, starts to unpack. And we start to think about who this could be and what their life might be like and what, what's happened to them and what the best thing to do for them to get support is. And specifically, what barriers they might be presenting with when coming forward to speaking to someone, whether that's a support service, their best mate, their family, to the police, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And what we're going to do now is just discuss nine very common ones that we at Survivors UK notice um, for people coming to our services. But these are just nine of probably billions of, I think there's like 8.6 billion people in the world. Every single person will have a unique barrier to their life. So if you can think of it, it probably exists. So after this talk, you might have some thoughts around some other barriers that I should probably put in my slides. And I'd love to hear from you if you think that there should be some. The first barrier that I would like to go through is toxic masculinity. Now that is a term that hopefully most of us have all heard about. Some of us might have experienced it. Some of us might have witnessed it, etc., etc. Now, the, a bugbear I have with this term is I think more recently it's becoming a bit interchangeable with the term masculinity. In and of itself, masculinity isn't actually a bad thing. It's, it's quite helpful for a lot of people um, and it's not owned by any one gender, this word masculinity. It is helpful for resilience, it's helpful for strength, it's helpful for being driven, it's helpful for a lot of different things. Now, where masculinity becomes toxic masculinity, a very different thing, is where these ideals, so that strength becomes too much and too, I'm too strong to show that I'm struggling and I'm too resilient to let people know I'm vulnerable and I'm too driven to slow down and say, I need some help. In the context of sexual violence, toxic masculinity might not align with someone's ability to say, I've experienced sexual violence and I need to talk about my feelings. I need to talk about how my life is spiraling. I need to talk to someone. Fear of the response and the fear of the consequences. I've just told you I'm a survivor. How are you gonna to respond to me? Are you going to be so shocked? Are you gonna fly off the handle? Are you gonna tell people? Are you gonna think I'm at risk to myself? Are you gonna think I'm a risk to others? The consequences, if I tell my personal tutor, a 
are they going to move me out of my form? Am I going to have to leave uni? Am I going to have to leave my halls of residence? Am I going to have to leave work? Is this person going to be kicked out? You might have feelings towards this person. Are they going to get in trouble? Minimization. We can all relate to minimization. In fact, I think I've done it in the last 24 hours where someone says, how are you doing? And you're like, yeah, I'm fine. You know, like weekend was great. I just chilled. It was all good. I went for a walk when secretly inside you are this close from throwing your laptop across the screen, across your room, going back to bed, sobbing and listening to someone like you by Adele. We've all been there, especially this year. In the context of sexual violence, so many people come to our helpline and they say things like, this happened and I'm really struggling about it. I'm really struggling with it, sorry. But, you know, there's probably someone much worse off out there who's had a much worse situation than me and they're just coping so much worse than me. Now, they've minimised so much that they've convinced themselves that they are fine in comparison to this completely hypothetical person. And we all do this quite a lot. And as I mentioned in the context of sexual violence, this is a really significant barrier because if all we are shown externally is that male rape and sexual abuse, including sexual abuse towards a non-binary and transgender person, is something that we can joke about and that we can you know, not take seriously, then all I'm going to know is that I shouldn't take it seriously as well. Self-blame and doubt. When we hear myths and we breathe life into myths and we don't publicly debunk these myths, we could be creating that self-blame and doubt for a survivor who is present. Lack of representation. If I don't see myself taken seriously in the media or in the narrative, then I'm not going to know that I can take myself seriously and I'm not going to know that it could happen to me. And flipping it on its head, if in support campaigns, all I see is not me. If I don't see my ethnicity, I don't see my gender, I don't see my age, I don't see my situation, I'm not going to know that that service can support me. Lack of autonomy. Now this year, again, we can all relate to this. For loads of different reasons, we have a limited amount of freedom. And with that, knowing that you might not be able to routinely engage with a service, so you open up and you speak to a helpline on a Wednesday, I don't want to speak to them next Wednesday and the following Wednesday for a significant amount of months. What if I just want to speak to someone for that day and then come back tomorrow and then not come back for a few months, etc. A lot of services, including Survivors UK, are very flexible about that. We will always try and support you around a schedule, around your schedule, sorry. But it's not publicly, um, it's not publicised, sorry. A lot of services don't publicise this. So knowing that you might be committing to something that you're not ready to do can be too much of a barrier. Fear of professional support. Now, I encourage that you do always speak to someone if you are affected by this. Speak to someone that you trust and you care about and that cares about you. But this can be a big barrier and I understand this because when you speak to this person or you speak to a professional person, are they going to get other professional bodies involved? Are they going to get the police involved? Are they going to get tutors involved? Are they going to get doctors involved? People that you just don't want to get involved. And obviously that can be a significant barrier because you feel like this incredibly personal and sensitive thing might be out of your hands and you might be out of control of this. Um, and we're going to come back to how you as an ally of a survivor can help with this barrier. Substance misuse and abuse. Now, if I was under, these, um, under the influence of an illegal substance at the time of the abuse of the sexual violence, am I going to get in trouble for coming forward? If I go to the police and I say, I've done X, Y, Z, and this happened as well, am I going to receive more consequences than the perpetrator of sexual violence? And for younger people, the fear of having to leave your home or going into care. Is it too much to completely uproot my life, leave my loved ones, my pets, my family members, my friends to talk about this? Is it too much? Is it easier to stay silent? Now, as I mentioned, these are just nine barriers, nine of innumerable barriers, and they are, there are more barriers with every day. 
So I really encourage that you do think of some yourself because you don't know who's around you who is currently oppressed by these barriers and the barriers that you might think of um, and how you can actually dismantle these barriers for these people or at least help them. So I'd now I'd like to mention what Survivors UK does um, as an organisation. So for anyone who is watching this, whether you feel that you want to get in touch with our service or for those that just want to know more about our service to help people who might benefit from our service. This is a really important part of the talk. So number one, we have a helpline, an online helpline, um, or an emotional support worker service, which I'm a part of. So this operates over five platforms currently. So we have WhatsApp, we have SMS, we have the website, we have letter, and we have email. Now, this is a space for survivors and allies of survivors to come and speak to us. Now, as I mentioned, it is strictly online at the moment. We are all working remotely, um, so we unfortunately don't have access to a telephone. This is always trained helpliners speaking to a client where a chat is under their control. In my experience, rarely do people want to speak about strictly their experience of sexual violence. They want to talk about what's going on right now. There's a lot of anxiety in the world right now. There's a lot of pressures and that can bring up a lot for people. And that 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 is what this service is for we want to make sure that you aren't alone with this and for allies it's about how the hell do i support someone with something so important that i i am a loving caring friend or a loving caring family member or or partner or professional supporting someone but i just don't know what tools to use to help this person that is what that space is for as well this is open seven days a week monday to sunday from 12 till 8 p.m. and we are also open the Chris, open over the Christmas break. So please, if you did want to get in touch about anything, don't hesitate. Um, and this is just some information on how to access um, our helpline, but I would encourage going through the website so you can get some more information. We also offer, and we still offer during lockdown um, and coronavirus times, uh, counselling and group work. So counselling uh, without getting too clinical, um, it starts with a chat um, or in clinical terms, an assessment, and then it begins with 12 weekly sessions um, to speak to a counsellor over Zoom um, with the opportunity to extend up to 48 weeks, um, with the average being around 27. And we are an empowerment based and trauma informed service. So we want to give a person the tools that they want for their own life. We're never going to tell someone this is what you need to do. We want to help them build their own journey. We want them to feel empowered that they have these choices and all of the control over the next steps. Group work is very similar, except the hint is in the name. It is a group of 12 survivors. So a group of survivors coming together, showing what they're struggling with, showing what they're coping with. And just speaking about this topic, creating aims together and creating that peer support through something incredibly isolating. We also um, re recently received some funding for our group work, so we have more specialist groups that we can offer for people who might benefit from being in a group with very similar people. So we currently have three for people who identify as transgender and non-binary. We understand that's a massive umbrella term. Um, children and young people from the ages of 13 to 19 and for people who are part of the BAME community. Um, and there is just some information on the um, referral pathway. And I should also mention if anyone would like these, a copy of these slides, um, please do email me and I'll send you a PDF copy, um, which could be really helpful if you wanted to familiarise yourself with the um, online referral form, but you can also check that out on our website. Now, ISFAs or Independent Sexual Violence Advisors are for practical and emotional support for those reporting to the police or considering reporting to the police and therefore the criminal justice process, which is a scary word. Not many of us are familiar with it. Now, ISFAs um, can help in thousands of ways, but here are just four. Um, and number one, that what they can do is providing information on the criminal justice system. As I just mentioned, so many of us aren't very clued up on what the criminal justice system is and how it operates and why should we? It's a very complex thing, a, very, a lot of myths around it. So what an ISFA can do is debunk a lot of those myths and come along to lots of meetings with this client. So going to court, going to the police and, and being there after court as well. They can help with concerns over safety. They can give health service information, including information with partnerships that we have with organisations um, such as the NHS. We have a trauma-informed sexual health service um, called Clinic 26. 
And a very important tool that they have is just being able to listen in that non-judgmental and supportive space. And there's just some information on the ISRA referral system. Um, and here is a slide on the wait times that we currently have for our services. Now, due to a lot of different things, demand, lockdown, funding, we do have quite significant wait times, um, but we need to be honest about these so that we can manage expectations. And we recognize that we need to be flexible with our services. We need to be supporting people in not necessarily a clinical way, but that can be very therapeutic. So we are op um, offering a lot more services. So things like client hangouts, social spaces for people to meet other clients and wellbeing days. So once a year, hosting a day where people can learn about trauma, they can learn about mindfulness, yoga, how Lego can help, how expressing trauma through art can help service user panels with feedback. We want to make sure our service is built from our clients, not us telling them how we operate. And as I mentioned, workshops. So learning about trauma and expressing yourself artistically with trauma. And finally, my role, the final role, um, which came into the organization um, in 2018. And that is all about, we recognize that our service was great, um, maybe I'm biased saying that, but I think our service is fantastic and life-saving a lot of the time. But not many people knew about us, so there are a lot of myths around what we can do or what we can't do or who we support. So we've been engaging organisations, institutions and individuals with Survivors UK since 2018 when I started to learn about this topic, to learn about our organisation and to create partnerships with anyone who will listen. Um, and we're also in a mission to increase awareness about sexual violence for men, non-binary and transgender people, as well as the topic in general. So since the start of 2019, these are all of the places that I have been lucky enough to deliver a very similar talk to what I'm delivering to you today. In fact, at the top right, you can see Goldsmiths already. Um, so Goldsmiths, I would like to say, um, have been a very supportive university. Um, uh, Joe has been fantastic inviting us to a lot of things. Um, as well as the bystander, there was a bystander intervention um, group, which were fantastic. Um, and I know that recently there's been a lot of uh, difficult news about um, some organisations within Goldsmiths. And I would like to stress that they are vital to Goldsmiths. And if we can, if, if there are any more ways to show support um, right now or in the future, we would do that as an organisation. Um, but please do support um, Joe, for more information, contact Joe about that organization. Um, but yes, now we get to add you, although you are already on there. So I guess I'll just put a times two. Um, now, how am I doing for time? Um, now, for these organizations on the board, you might notice that not all of them are charities, not all of them are universities, they're all sorts of organizations. These are people that might not necessarily engage with this topic in their day to day life or think that they don't engage with it in their day to day life. And that is because it is time that we create this society that is listening to survivors of all demographics. It's, it's 2020. We need to get moving with this topic. We need to not be at a space where all we need to do is debunk myths. We need to move on from that. We need to start creating this legislation to start lobbying for change. And a big slap in the face for me um, was one of these organizations, um, one that you wouldn't expect, um, asked me this question for one of my talks. And it was just, they didn't say it in this, in this nicer way. Um, I rephrased it to being, why does Survivors UK do what you do? And I felt a bit annoyed and I'm gonna say it, I felt a bit sassy on that day when they asked this question because how do you explain how this is such an important topic in just three quick bullet points, which is what they were asking, when I've already spent, I think, at least 45 minutes talking to you guys about how important this is. And I hope that you recognise how important this topic is as well. So instead of giving them just three bullet points, I wanted to give them 25 numbers, but specifically 25 people. So what I asked our counsellors to do at the assessment time, uh, so when people first came to Survivors UK, is to collect some data on the multiple needs that they were presenting with. So things like relationship difficulties. And I asked them, yeah, out of 25 people taken at random, how many of them were presenting with things like this? So 25 out of 25 people were experiencing significant relationship difficulties. 
25 out of 25 reported significant self-esteem difficulties. 24 out of 25 reported a diagnosis of depression. 20 out of 25 reported a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder with anxiety. 20 out of 25 reported significant sexual health difficulties. 17 out of 25 reported substance addiction. 10 out of 25 reported a diagnosis of insomnia. And during the time that we collected this research, about three weeks, one of those people took their own life. Now, if that doesn't show you why Survivors UK does what they do, then I didn't, I don't know how else to really phrase it. To say that our service can be life-saving, but unfortunately we can't always be life-saving. There is so much for these people to unpack, for survivors of all genders and all demographics to unpack. And the silence, the shame, the multiple myth, or the numerous myths and barriers for people coming forward can understandably be too much for when they finally manage, potentially after 26 years, to come and say, this is what's happened to me. And they are told that unfortunately it will be a 10 month wait before we can start addressing that. It can of course be too much. Now, of course, if, if we could, we would reduce that wait time, but due to demand and the resources that we have and that we are currently given because of this lack of awareness, that is the best that we can do. And I didn't stop there. And I wanted to share and introduce them to someone, someone a bit more, a bit real as well and give them their story. So I'd like to do that with you today as well. So I'd like you to meet Elijah. When Elijah was aged seven to 10, uh, he was repeatedly subjected to sexual abuse um, from a close family friend. And at the age of 10, the family friend moved away. So the sexual abuse stopped. And like so many survivors, he didn't tell anyone and he was labeled as reclusive throughout his life with significant difficulties in creating and maintaining relationships. 23 years later at the age of 33, the perpetrator moved back to the area where Elijah was still living. And by this point, the perpetrator had children and the children had children of their own around a similar age to Elijah at the time of the abuse. So understandably, this prompted a fast, intense onset of depression, triggering memories of the abuse and substance addiction. And this contributed to the end of his relationship. So his life completely crumbled. His family also rejected him as this was a close family friend. And how could they? And this led to further isolation. Now he did manage to tell his ex-partner about the abuse that he experienced and they helped him report to the police and the police to Survivors UK. And he was in counselling for just four months when he claimed that he'd finally learned to connect with people even in the hardest of times. He said that from this he had dramatically improved in trusting people, speaking about his abuse and strengthening his relationship with his friends. He's now in a committed, communicative and stable relationship, something he has not been able to experience before. Now, I used to say that that was a success story, um, but I've recently realized just how insensitive it is to say that because that last green paragraph that he's now in a, in a committed community of stable relationship, etc. Most of us would hopefully say that, yeah, that's a pretty normal life. He's just, you know, being one of those people who would walk down the street and we wouldn't know. So why can I say it's a success story simply? because it's in the context of Elijah being subjected to a horrific sexual abuse situation. It seems just a bit insensitive to me. And what I wonder is for 23 years of Elijah's life, he was unable to speak to someone throughout college, throughout university, and throughout work after university as well. And I wonder what, what could have happened if there was just one person that thought, let me check in with this person. Let me speak about this topic. Let me give this person that open door to speak about this. How different Elijah's life could have been. Which is what brings me here. Now I have mentioned around the issue. I've mentioned around what Survivors UK does. I've mentioned why we do what we do. But this is probably the most important part of this talk because it is what you can do. It's not enough for us to come to do these talks um, and for you to listen, which is so fantastic. 
but then for this information to stay in this room or on this screen or on your laptop in your headphones we need people to spread this word we need for this to be on people's radar and this is all about what you can do and this is all about specifically the tools that you all already have to help a survivor when they come forward and say do you know what i am a survivor actually this this happened to me and thank you for bringing it up which i hope that some of you will feel more confident in doing after coming to this talk so i'm a firm believer that this topic right now is very inaccessible for a lot of people um, and i think one of the biggest barriers to coming forward and speaking about this is the language it's very jargonistic it's very clinical and it feels almost unsafe to be interacting with a topic when we might be like well hang on should a helpline speak or should a counselor speak about this so i like to make it a bit more accessible and i like to use metaphors which i guess could make it more inaccessible for someone um, who might get a bit confused but bear with me because i'd like to share that with you today and i've mentioned throughout this that i like to use tools um no, sorry that we all have tools to help survivors. And that's the analogy I like to use. So I'd like to, as I mentioned, just share that with you today. So number one, the tool that we all already have is our metaphorical cement mixer. Now, like a cement mixer, we know not to force information out of someone or out of something before they are ready to process it or force this material out before they are ready to give it. And similarly, we know not to ask for this material if our metaphorical cement mixer isn't turned on and ready to process that information. So in the context of this situation of sexual violence, don't force information or material out of this person before they are ready to give it or if they don't want to give this to you. But on the other side, don't enter this situation or ask about this situation if you yourself aren't ready to listen and process it if you know that you've got to get somewhere in 10 minutes don't ask about sexual violence which obviously needs a lot of time to speak about and also you need to be safe you need to make sure that you're in a good place to speak about this topic so being patient both with them and yourself letting them supply information at their own pace and being ready to process what is being said your second tool in your toolbox is your metaphorical unlimited tape measure. Now, unlimited is a word I'm sure we wish could apply to so many things, uh, time before 2020, time after 2020, definitely. Maybe even some of you loved this year, so time during lockdown. How about just time in general? Giving someone an unlimited, an infinite amount of time to understand and explore what has happened to them is an invaluable tool in your toolbox. They might need a lot of time to understand, to have the language around this, to explore and to feel comfortable speaking with you about this topic. So while this is happening, provide infinite measures of time and patience and respect to them. And also honesty about your own needs, letting them know that sometimes you might not know what to say and sometimes you might have your own limitations on how much you can support them. The brick. Helping this person build up strength and trust to explore this topic with your support and reminding them that they are in control. All survivors in one way or another have had um, choice and control taken away from them, whether that was their experience of sexual violence or with the people that they might have told afterwards before you. Give that back to them. Let them know that they are in control and empowered to take their next steps. Now, mess is an inevitable part of construction and too much mess can be dangerous and can make a construction site dangerous and it can stop the construction process. And the same can be said for a recovery journey with negative emotions being the mess. So too much, too many negative emotions can prevent the recovery journey and can make it dangerous, in fact. So this is why we bring in the skip, because you can help throw away these negative emotions for people. The first thing you can do to help someone is thank them for their bravery. We've just spent a lot of time talking about all of the things that they might have come through to speak to you. So thank them for doing that and help throw away any ideas of cowardice that they might have. Believe this person and help throw away any, uh, any language that both of you might use around, did it really happen? Is it really something you asked for? Is it something that 
can actually happen to someone of your demographic. And the final thing is help throw away that blame. Most survivors I know come forward and they say, for some reason or other, some element they should feel blame for, when in reality, nothing that happened or is happening, they should feel blame for. So help throw that away for them. And the final thing, the most important tool you have is your safety helmet. No one should enter this topic without looking after themselves. Now, on a construction site, it's much easier to see physical risk. We can notice things, we can see these. Non-physical risk is quite hard to see. Our mental risk is very hard to see. And sometimes we only are aware of it when we're too far in. So it's so important to be, to be aware and have this insight on how this can take a toll on you to support someone, especially if you care about them. So carry your safety helmet in. Make sure that your tools, all of these tools that you might be using and more are kept in pristine condition to make sure that you are looking after yourself because that is the best way to look after someone else. I know that there is support out there for you. I know that there will be support in Goldsmiths to talk to your friends, to talk to the student union and to talk to organizations like Survivors UK as well. So this is the final two minutes, I think, final two slides. I'm very sorry, I think I've gone five minutes over. Um, but now I've, I've mentioned what we do as an organization. I've mentioned what you can or are already doing, but now what can we all do? And that is recognizing our room for growth. And that is for everyone that is including organizations like ours. These are just some quick bullet points to maybe spark some interest or spark some cogs going in your brain. So promoting a space that welcomes speaking and is prepared to do so, put it on your story, put it, say it's your friend group, put it in a group chat, just say something to open that door. Say, I've just been to a talk speaking about X. Did anyone know about this? That can be really helpful. Publicly ensuring privacy and that you will keep something confidential. Giving someone this support material, this is more for organizations, that is representative and welcoming for a lot of different demographics. Knowing the organizations you refer to and how to refer to them getting involved with campaigns and using your voice, reviewing practices and policies organizations wide and lobbying against things that you don't agree with, challenging myths when you encounter them and being sensitive to the many barriers that a survivor has come through. It's okay to make mistakes around labels. Some people don't like to be referred to as a survivor. Some don't like to be referred to as a victim. Some don't like any. Go with what that individual wants and move on with that. There is no stereotypical survivor, and remember that. It's a constant process, easy to slip behind, but there are organizations like Survivors UK here to help. Final slide. Thank you for bearing with me, everyone. So I've been using primar primarily the term survivor to describe someone who has experienced sexual violence, and that is the term that I personally like to use. And the reason for that is if you were to Google the definition definition of the term victim, this is what you'd get. A person harmed, injured or killed as a result of a crime, accident or other event or action. I would like you to try and think of a survivor that you might already know. And if you don't want to or if you can't, maybe try and think of someone I showed you in that video. I don't see those people as sufferers, as casualties, as wounded. I see them as incredibly strong individuals people with the emotional or mental qualities necessary in dealing with a difficult or distressing situation, people with fortitude, resilience, backbone, spirit, Dunkirk spirit, whatever that one means. And for me, these definitions don't align with one another. So with all of the talks I go to, I try to remind people why I like to use the term survivor and why our namesake, Survivors UK, is as it is. That People who experience sexual violence are people who can continue to live or exist, especially in spite of danger or hardship. These are people who continue, remain, last and endure. But most importantly, these are people that can live on. Thank you very much um, for sticking with me through that, everyone. Um, whether it was recording or you're here today, I'm really grateful that you've spent um, an hour and nine minutes um, listening to me talk about this. As I mentioned, if anyone has any questions, um, please do email me. Or for those of you that are present today, please um, feel free to talk now. 
But other than that, take care of yourselves. Make sure that after this, you listen to something that uplifts you, puts you back to like baseline if you can. So no Adele. Um, and yeah, look after yourself. Thank you very much.